It is the late summer of 1944, just a few months after the Allied invasions at Normandy. And now, support from the air is crucial for the success of the troops on the ground. One of the many units providing this key support is the 355th Fighter Group, a unit of P-51 Mustangs flying out of England. Primarily, these P-51s flew as high-altitude bomber escort for the large raids over Germany. But now, with the Allies pushing into France, the Mustangs are also operating as low-level ground attack fighters to help clear defenses and disrupt German supply lines. This is the job to which the 355th Fighter Group was assigned on August 18th of 1944. During this mission, their leader of one of the squadrons would be a young pilot by the name of Major Burt Marshall. Marshall had been a football star in Texas before the war and had also played at Vanderbilt University. But now, instead of leading a football team, he was leading American fighter pilots into combat and had now become one of the fastest promotions in the 8th Air Force. Arriving in the summer, he scored his very first kill on his second mission while flying support for D-Day on June 6th when he shot down a German Stuka. His success continued and it quickly became clear that he was a cool and collected leader, making good decisions in combat and always leading by example. And thanks to Burt Marshall's son, we even have some of the authentic combat footage from some of his aerial kills in the following weeks. Here we can see two 109s shot down by Burt Marshall on June 20th. His kills, like the two that can be seen here, helped to set the stage for his promotion and the position that he would have at the end of the summer. Now, in August, in his P-51 named Jane 4, he was officially an ace and had worked his way up to the commanding officer of one of the squadrons in the 355th. Coincidentally, one of the men flying under his command in his flight was Lieutenant Royce Priest, flying a P-51 named Weepin Deacon 2. Interestingly, he had actually trained as a glider pilot before transitioning to fighters and being assigned to the 355th, and by pure chance actually knew Burt Marshall before they had been assigned to the unit, as he was also from Texas and had followed Marshall's stellar football career closely, calling him a personal hero. Now, as they were both Mustang pilots, Royce was honored to follow him into combat and felt that his life was in good hands. But little did he know that on this day in August of 1944, the tables would turn, and it was his hero that would need saving. During this particular mission, Captain Marshall and the 354th Fighter Squadron were directed to carry out sweeps to the north and east of Paris. Under each wing was a 250-pound bomb intended to strike targets of value on the ground, especially supply lines. As Marshall led his squadron in the sweep over France, they initially spotted some rail cars, but after seeing red crosses painted on the top, they opted to find a different target. Soon enough, another rail yard was spotted, and it looked like a quality target, but before an attack was ordered, the normal protocol was for the mission leader to send down a flight to scan the area for flak and anti-aircraft. But Marshall, being the leader that he was, chose his own flight to go down and check the area. So he and three other Mustangs dove down and prepared to hit the train yard. As Major Marshall led the American fighters in the scanning attack on the yard, they quickly realized that they had fallen into a trap. As the Mustangs prepared to fire upon the German train, the walls of the train fell away to reveal that it was actually a German flat car one of the most deadly threats to a P-51 at low level. The following is Lieutenant Royce Priest's recollection of what happened next. As we made our first pass on the rail traffic, my particular target car and locomotive dropped its side doors and we were staring at very ugly 20 mm and 40 mm snouts. I saw a flash to one side and looked over towards Bert's ship. Bert took one hit under the exhaust stack and a big hit behind the radiator scoop, apparently just missing the fuselage tank because he didn't blow up. But he was burning and smoking heavily, and I knew for sure that his P-51 wouldn't come home. I called the damage in to him and heard him disgustedly tell us to wave off while he looked for a place to belly it in. The German trap had worked. Major Marshall's Mustang had taken a direct hit. 
His plane quickly slowed, and being at such a low altitude, he chose a good field and decided to bring his plane in for an emergency landing. As he prepared to do this, however, Lieutenant Royce Priest hated the idea of watching his personal hero and leader left behind. So he came up with a bold idea. I got back on the radio and suggested that he head for a field about a mile away and I would land nearby to pick him up. He told me in very clear and concise language that I was to take the squadron and get the hell out of there. While I observed Bert's Mustang limping away, still badly smoking, I could see his prop RPM slow even further and knew it was just a matter of minutes at most before he went in. As he flared out over a plowed field by a tree-lined road, I told Woolard that I was going to land in a wheat field next to Bert. Bert heard the RT traffic and immediately and profanely told me to not land nearby, and that is a direct order. There were a few more adjectives that I can't remember, but I did understand what he said. Major Marshall, without hesitation, replied to Bert with a stern no, ordering the young lieutenant not to land and risk himself. According to a later report, Marshall actually gave this order multiple times, making it clear that he did not want Priest to land. A few moments later, Marshall successfully brought his own damaged plane down into an open field. It seemed certain that the esteemed leader would now be a POW for the remainder of the war, as he was less than a mile or two from German troops. But then, to his dismay, he saw something another Mustang, that of Lieutenant Priest, coming down in a nearby field. Apparently, Priest simply had too much respect for Marshall to let him fall into German hands without an attempted rescue. So he blatantly disregarded orders and came down anyways. As he passed over Marshall's Mustang searching for a place to land, he saw his leader burning his plane on the ground to prevent it from falling into German hands. And fortunately, now, because he had trained as a glider pilot for the U.S. Army, he knew exactly what to look for on the ground and chose an ideal landing field with just enough room to take off. He brought down Weep and Deacon successfully, scattering a few local farmers as he came to a stop in a field about half a mile away from Bert's Mustang. But as he began to frantically search for his leader from the cockpit, he spotted something else. A truckload of German infantry storming down the road, right towards his location. He immediately called on the radio for the rest of the flight to take out the trucks, but they were already on the job. They lined up the truck and destroyed it in a hail of gunfire. It was a perfect shot, but if any of the Germans had survived the attack, they were likely not going to be friendly towards Priest and Marshall should they be captured. About this time, Bert finally arrived. It was a long run and he was sweating profusely, but more than that, he was livid with Royce. Marshall berated the young pilot and told him to take off and save himself while the Germans were closing in. But a stubborn Lieutenant Royce Priest stepped out of the cockpit and took off his own parachute, pulling the ripcord to make it worthless and making it clear that he was refusing to take off without Marshall. So with no other option, Major Burt Marshall hopped into the cockpit of the P-51, directing Priest to sit on top and fly while Marshall sat underneath. Designed for only one person, the cockpit of the P-51 was extremely cramped and the two barely fit but somehow they made it work. It was incredibly cramped. My head was just above the gun sight and pressed forward to allow the canopy to close and very awkward to manage the throttles and rudders. I could just press far enough back to enable me to get enough stick control to lift us out of there. I couldn't see the instrument panel, probably for the best, as I really didn't want to know that my coolant was dead, if it was, at this late stage of the game. As Priest pushed the throttle forward and they began to move, gunfire was heard coming from a nearby tree line, and it was made known that another convoy of soldiers was now on their way. Fortunately, the other Mustangs above tore up the second convoy, and the German gunfire failed to land any hits. After raising the gear and gaining some altitude, the boys of the 355th turned to the west and were headed home. After a long and cramped flight, Lieutenant Priest successfully landed back at Steeple Morden, 
and the grounds crews no doubt had to do a double take when they saw two pilots climb out of a P-51 cockpit. After the feelings of anger towards Lieutenant Priest had subsided, Major Marshall sincerely thanked the young pilot. It was a special moment between two Texas boys, but then the focus shifted towards what might happen next. Lieutenant Priest was fairly sure that he was likely to be transferred out of the unit or taken off of combat duty completely. After all, he had just ignored a direct combat order, twice. But understandably, news of the feat quickly spread, and his commander was put in an interesting predicament. It was not every day that you have to decide if a pilot should be court-martialed or put in for the Medal of Honor. It was shortly thereafter decided that he should be recommended for an award. To his surprise, a few days later, Lieutenant Royce Priest received news that he was being awarded the Distinguished Service Cross instead of disciplinary action. He later found out that the commander of the 8th Air Force, Jimmy Doolittle, after much debate, had decided to give Lieutenant Priest the DSC instead of the Medal of Honor, as he did not want to encourage other pilots to attempt such a reckless rescue. Doolittle later said with a grin, he had never thought about issuing a regulation not to land behind enemy lines and attempt a rescue, because after all, who would be that stupid? but he would in fact now be forced to issue a sternly worded order prohibiting such attempts shortly after this event. Both Priest and Marshall would go on to survive the war and remained close friends for many years. This would go down as one of the only times in history that a downed pilot was rescued by a friendly fighter. Comment whether or not you'd have the courage to do this for your friend and make sure you share it with them. Subscribe and I'll see you next time.